to launch an exciting um, uh, day two of this boot camp. Um, I want to begin, as I typically do, with a retrospective back on uh, material that we saw on the previous day. I will again remark that from an administrative standpoint, I did post um, the slides from yesterday um, up on the site. So if people are interested in um, going in uh, and browsing them, reviewing them, you're welcome to do so now. Um, and slides from, anticipated slides from this morning. Um, so uh, yesterday, um, after some logistics uh, specifics, we um, introduced a dynamic model. Uh, this is a dynamic model that was uh, uh, predominantly agent-based. It, it wove in a, uh, an element of system dynamics modeling as well um, for continuous dynamics associated with weight in particular. Um, and I used that model to, to help motivate and to help make concrete um, um, what's involved in elements of dynamic modeling. And I made a lot of utterances in the course of that presentation as to why we build models, many of the advantages of building models, how models differ from, uh, dynamic models differ on the, other, on the one hand from, uh, from uh, statistical or machine learning models um, as they are traditionally uh, applied uh, on the other. Um, and uh, pointed to some features that are common to all modeling traditions, uh, but for which that model served as an exemplar. So uh, phenomena such as tipping points, phenomena such as emergence. Um, I alluded to path dependence, the fact that the evolution of a, of a given agent, for example, might depend on, on their history in a big way, much as a child's progress through life might depend on early life experiences that are formative and shaping their vulnerabilities. Um, and I alluded to the fact that uh, models uh, of this sort that we build are built to deal with these gnarly systems um, that are not merely complicated but are uh, are complex in a, in a technical sense. Complex in the sense that we can't reduce them to the sum of the parts, to the average of the parts. Um, they're, they're different than the sum of the parts in qualitative ways. Um, and these systems uh, are typically nonlinear, um, and they uh, almost invariably have surprises for us. We're not outfit with a complement of wetware, sort of in our reasoning, that allows us to effectively interact with these systems. Um, and these systems are not exceptions. Um, they, uh, they exist in virtually all the hardest types of problems we grapple with uh, as institutions, as a society, and indeed globally. Um, and I've listed some major you know, health policy problems here, um, recognizing that this is just a, a tiny slice. And I want to emphasize that this is not a matter of, um, of, of merely enumerating systems which are complicated in the sense of descriptively involved with lots of moving parts. Um, these are systems where we, we have a, a situation where the system as a whole is just very different from what our understanding would arrive at if we just looked at each piece in isolation. Much as our understanding of a traffic jam can't be reduced merely to, to knowing lots about each car. It's not going to tell us how traffic jams um, evolve, how they come about, how to resolve them most effectively. Is it about vehicles? Surely. Uh, if a vehicle is more reliable um, or less reliable, it, it may have some impact on traffic jams in terms of breakdowns, etc. cetera. Um, but it's a lot more than about those pieces. It's about it's about a, a higher level of, of behavior for the system as a whole that transcends any one particular element of the system or collection um, of, of particular elements. Um, and these systems are all around us. You know, I, I use this as an example, and one you'll be hearing about this week, the Emergency Department Waiting Times project that we, we were uh, 
privileged to participate in and to help guide with the um, provincial uh, government, uh, the Ministry of Health here, um, where you know there were um, the system showed its face in the emergency department and long waiting times for beds, um, but those working with the system. Uh, while th the impulse of many was to say, well, let's fix the emergency room. So let's get more emergency room doctors, or let's put in more beds, or you know, get more triage nurses, or, or what have you. Those working with the system soon realized that while the face of the system was shown in the emergency room, the causes of it went well beyond the emergency room. You know, we, we couldn't get people to beds in the emergency room in a, in a timely fashion because those beds were occupied. And why were they occupied? Well, they were occupied because there were people in the emergency room who couldn't be discharged to the wards of the hospital for acute care. Why couldn't they be discharged to the wards of the hospital? Well, the wards are full. Why are the wards full? Well, there are people there, amongst other things, who can't be discharged to the community because they have complex needs that can't be met by community services. And so what ostensibly is a, is a matter of behavior of one part of the system, and you think it's, it's a problem with that part of the system, often in these complex systems, it, that, that part of the system is just mirroring dysfunction throughout the system, you know, systematic imbalances, where the problem is not perhaps overall level of resourcing, it's a matter of imbalance and where those resources are put, say community services compared to acute care. And if we have these imbalances in a system, we may see phenomena at particular places that are dysfunctional. But it's not a, it's not a problem about those pieces. It's a problem of, of the system as a whole. And we get phenomena that we spoke of yesterday, feedbacks um, that, that lead to unexpected effects sometimes, or where we take action and it pushes back against us. We get lock-in effects where we it, that intervening early and heading off a situation, think addiction, can be incredibly more, um, less resource intensive and less um, suffering uh, intensive than if you have to pick up the pieces after someone's addicted, for example, and you try to resolve the issue then. There are these lock-in effects. Um, similarly with the opioid epidemic in, in North America, you know, people might think of it, the police might think of it as a problem of police response to overdose cases and police exposure to fentanyl and so on. But the fact is that what's going on the police side is, is an indication of what's going on in the emergency rooms. It's an indication, it's reflected in what's going on in, in uh, physicians' offices who manage chronic pain patients and post-operative patients, et cetera. So here we often have these systems that are that are really uh, tangled in the sense that what we see in one place is an indication of what's going on elsewhere. And intervening in one place ends up having these ramifications throughout the, the, the system. And we could list many other examples. Antibiotic resistance is another, another big one. When, when we have these systems, traditionally we're often like these blind men and the elephant, right? Each, uh, each silo of, of, of the um, the system uh, is often operating focused on issues there, but what's driving the issues there is often issues with other people. And yet, like blind men and the elephant, we're, we're left grasping at pieces when we have to deal with the system as a whole. We have to deal with the, you know, the elephant uh, as a whole. And I had appealed to two big needs yesterday. One is the need of what's going on in the system. Um, this may sound obvious. You know, you see rising reported cases of chlamydia, and you say, okay, we've got a real problem as a system. But it's not always so. Even for that case, you know, there's a, a real question. Are those rising cases of chlamydia an indication, for example, or not so much of rising incidents, but the fact that we are reporting cases more effectively? We're finding cases out there that weren't found previously and maybe that's why we see this rise in reporting. Not because there are more true cases out there, more true people infected, it's just maybe we're better at, at finding them. Maybe it's a success of, of case finding, right? Um, or perhaps it's a sign that we're treating, again, a rested immunity hypothesis, we're treating people too aggressively early and blunting 
development of immunity. There's many reasons we might see that rise other than a, a faster spread of infection. And we need models often to, to help us understand what's going on. Particularly because when we have theory about the world, you know, some cherished theory, maybe it's the arrested immunity hypothesis, we're often grasping at evidence in the world to try to figure out, is that theory grounded? Is that a, is that a reasonable theory? Is it an evidenced theory? Is it a, is it a sound theory? Does it jive with the empirical evidence? And is it a theory that, um, that is consistent with the understanding of system stakeholders as well as our observations for the world? And one of the comments I had yesterday is we rely on only informal reasoning. You know, imagine that model we looked at yesterday. Again, if I asked Wade to look at that and tell me what the effects would be over time so I can compare it with, uh, with uh, comparable empirical data and you know, assess whether that model jives with that data, that would be a very hard thing to do. But the most quantitative of individuals, Einstein's, are just not able to do that because of our biologic complement. Um, so trying to understand the degree to which our theory is consistent with evidence is, is hard. Even harder is this need to, inter to reason about the effects of interventions, you know, where to best intervene, how to intervene, and implementation science issues, like how soon will I see effects, how can I scale this up, to what degree did that learning from when, what went on in Saskatoon, does that translate to Toronto or, or Vancouver? Um, how do we make an implementation financially sustainable? These are issues that I know Sher Young has, has looked at in, in some of his work. Um, so when we have these complex systems and we try to think about interventions, it's really challenging. I mean, we intervene in one place and it ripples through to other places. It sometimes uh, leads to perhaps good effects sooner and then blowback later. Um, we, we end up having disproportionate effects where if we can just intervene enough in a certain place, maybe we reach a tipping point. And we're struck by you know, how, just how difficult it is to, to decide where, when, how much to invest resources for action. Right? This is particularly challenging because when we have these theories, when we think about interventions that, that intervene on the system beyond our postulated understanding of how the system behaves, trying to understand to what degree this will all yield desired outcomes and how soon and how big the effects will be and what are the trade-offs between different types of outcomes. Um, it's, it's really difficult based on, on informal reasoning. Um, and the consequences of this are writ large, you know, misperceptions, surprising behavior. I spoke of policy resistance yesterday. Um, uh, and uh, you know we invest in resources and we get very little bang for the buck or even it causes net harm, like the low tar cigarettes. And this is, makes it really hard to learn from experience in these systems, uh, to learn from what went on again in, in Swift Current for applying it in, in Saskatoon or Saskatoon to Toronto. Makes it difficult to coordinate because I don't understand how your actions affect me or how mine affect you. And, and so it's easy to manage, to try managing in a blind, siloed way where we run across purposes. And you know, it's hard for, um, for, for planning effectively for the system as a whole and, and designing. And we run, as I said, like King Canute yesterday into situations where we're just working at cross purposes with things. We're trying to order back the tide as King Canute's advisors uh, unwisely urged him to do. And it, it just doesn't work that way. You know, we end up pounding our, our head into the wall. And, um, uh, you know, what I presented yesterday was this notion that models are, are operationalized dynamic hypotheses. They're, they're often working hypotheses about the world. They're, they're, we should never invest them with our full faith and confidence. But rather, we use them to, to learn where our understanding is, is, is off. And, and we build these models in large part to reason about counterfactuals. Um, I, I appeal to this notion, importantly, as an in contradistinction to statistical machine learning models as traditionally applied, where we're dealing with associations um, that are observed from the world. And I noted that those associations are contingent upon. Um, they are. Uh, uh, they they uh, rest upon and depend upon 
an, an underlying data generating process that, that gave rise to them. And when we intervene in a system or when exogenous factors change in a big way, those patterns may change in a way that our predictive algorithms from a machine learning standpoint so accurate previously taking into account so many covariates or, or uh, features now just don't cut it. Um, with dynamic models, we are seeking to postulate a, a causal, this causal structure of the system so that when we undertake actions, um, we, we can understand how they might change things. So we saw yesterday they can change these patterns. When we undertake a change in the system, like an intervention, putting around lots of supermarkets throughout the city, you're getting people to, to, to engage in physical activity through enhanced uh, uh, built environment or what have you, um, it can change those associations in big ways, and models can help us understand how it, how it might change. And I argue that simulation models represent some sort of mathematical process in, in different ways, but, um, but they share this common feature of depicting sort of the causal, attempting to depict the causal structure of the world, the positive causal structure of the world. And I argue that these models offer many benefits. Uh, if you look at the writings of Don Burke, um, who until recently was um, dean of the School of Public Health at Pitt, or you look at Josh Epstein's work, they have lists of dozens of uses of simulation models in health. Um, to make explicit models of causality um, was one of the most important that I put forward. But this doesn't take into account the operationalized nature, uh, precise character of the theory captured. Um, and uh, it, it, it's very useful. We can put our assumptions, take it out of our head, and put it in a place people can critique and we can refine. But what I really emphasized yesterday is through simulation, by operationalizing our understanding in a precise enough way to be run, going beyond you know, causal loop diagrams to stocks and flows or, or agent-based uh, analogs you know, with, with uh, state charts, events, and uh, all these features we'll be seeing, um, you can do much better than that. You can aid learning. Um, and you can manage systems more effectively by serving as what-if tools. Um, I want to talk more about this in model conceptualization. So why do I model? I, I model to learn more effectively about the world and learn more quickly. This is particularly important in this age of big data where um, we, are, uh, we have recourse to a growing amount of evidence. And uh, models help us turn that evidence into value, into insight and understanding in a more reliable way. And when um, the world changes in, in ways that uh, change the data generating process, models help us, uh, help us better understand the implications uh, in the new system and do so in ways that um, are robust given counterfactual changes. Um, I also model to learn more effectively by making assumptions shared and explicit. This is kind of the most basic thing. You know, you can capture with a causal loop diagram or even a diagram like this from, from any logic used qualitatively to discuss with stakeholders. Um, we, we often will build very visual models um, that we can use with stakeholders to have discussions. And uh, one of the things that I'd be glad to cover, uh, not planned in the, in the event, but which I, I do hope to cover, concerns models that, um, uh, ways of representing agent-based models and hybrid models that can be used in participatory processes, much like causal loop diagrams. I also model to make my assumptions precise and testable, you know, and, and things that can be, again, evaluated in this crucible of, of empirical evidence. And the argument I had yesterday is these models are not viewed as best views as crystal balls, but in Jeff uh, McDonald's world as, as learning prosthesis um, that help us learn more quickly by more quickly spotting when our understanding of the world just doesn't jive with the evidence. Because we can run the model and see does its expectations of what we should see about this factor, or that factor, or that factor in fact, jive with, with what we see from the world. That's one major way. 
does it jive with stakeholder understanding from day in, day out activity within the system? So models help us put this empirical evidence to use. Um, if we have empirical evidence, put it to use more effectively. You'll sometimes hear people talk about dynamic models as if they are an alternative route to insight than empirical evidence. It's kind of like you have data and you have models. And we, you know, I've heard quite a few times in my career, we have to be careful with those models. We still need evidence about the world. Well, yeah, we need models in part to make sense of evidence about the world, to, to, to tell us what its implications are for the underlying behavior of the system, what its implications are by extension for policy. Um, so models are used well in conjunction with empirical evidence and they help use that empirical evidence to weed out theories of the world that are inconsistent with that evidence. That we wouldn't realize it because we can't um, simulate it in our head, but you know, if we have theories, and, and I noted if we rely on informal reasoning, testing if that theory is consistent with this evidence we see or that evidence is very difficult. If we have a simulation model, it can help us say, okay, this theory is entirely inconsistent with these lines of empirical evidence. It just can't, no matter how you calibrate it or make assumptions about under under evidence parameters, you just can't match this empirical evidence. So a dynamic model addresses this key of going from theory and telling us to what degree is does it um, does it account for or does it it match up with evidence we see from the world. And often we do so with many lines of evidence, not just one, but like that model we saw yesterday where we could scroll around and see those different graphs that you know, we'd expected this about the relationship between weight and proximity to a grocery store, this between weight and preference for, uh, for foods from convenience stores or what have you. We can align in a, a model with, with many lines of evidence. And the, and the conviction here is, was first articulated by Francis Bacon, to my, my knowledge in the Western tradition, which is um, uh, one sooner learns from error than from confusion. And at, at first blush, this sounds paradoxical and arguably nonsensical. That, you know, uh, how could it be better to be wrong than to be skeptically kind of um, reserved judgment? The, the point here is uh, that he was saying is the, the, it was the 16th century version of a uh, fail early, fail often. Look, don't don't take this theory or this hypothesis as a given, but take it as a working hypothesis, advance it, and, and give it a try, and see if it works. And through that, we, we go two steps forward, because uh, if it is consistent with the evidence, we've got uh, a theory going that is looking promising. If it's not, at least we've learned something and can scratch that off and, and focus on another hypothesis. So with a model, we have this systematic way of replacing confusion about what's going on in the world, underlying drivers for a system in the world by, by learning. We can take two steps forward by allowing us to more quickly recognize when, when our, mis our thinking about the world, however cherished, just doesn't add up. Doesn't add up to, to the evidence. Um, and it lets us you know, support theorizing about what's going on out there in the underlying system that can aid in, in theory building. Um, and we'll talk about different uses of the model uh, models uh, in the model conceptualization system. One point I didn't talk about yesterday in my kind of informal walkthrough with that model is, look, there's an argument to be made, you know, as when it, when it comes up with why model, because we all model anyway, regardless of whether we, we understand it or not, regardless of whether it's explicit, shared, precise, or whether it's inchoate, rough, and hidden in our heads, we're always using mental models. We're always using models of one sort or another, and mental models we are using throughout our day um, to learn how to navigate from here to here, how to get to a Starbucks from here, how to get uh, back to your hotel or, or, or back to your dorm. Um, and uh, 
we're relying on these mental models often um, in critical ways um, with good reason. Uh, but computational models take the benefits of these mental models and they allow it to translate it to much more sophisticated and precise ways of characterizing the world in ways that are consciously shared and refined collectively. Okay. Um, so it allows us to, to challenge and sharpen these mental models in a more aggressive way. So we can take things out of our heads, put them into an explicit form, others can critique, uh, others can challenge just on the basis of the structure, but we can also see their logical implications in a way we can never do so with the world to compare with empirical evidence. So this is the larger prospect of modeling. Um, I commented on, on understanding things in the world. I would note for those who are here from my last boot camp, together with machine learning, um, these techniques are particularly promising in illuminating areas of the system where we don't have evidence directly, but where the, the evidence we do have together with the model can kind of shed light, much like a candle here can shed light throughout the room, a, uh, a model um, uh, equipped with um, uh, some of these machine learning algorithms and the depiction of dynamic structure from the model and some evidence can illuminate what's going on in broader areas of the system at a quantitative level in a way we could never do so with, with data collected from the world. Um, I'll mention one other thing. Once, once you're fairly, you have a degree of conviction in the model or you think, you know, this is worth some confidence, um, compared to traditional techniques, you use it to estimate intervention effects, um, the, uh, the outcomes of interventions. Um, modelers differ greatly, I found, in, in how quickly they are willing with a, a competitive model to, to use it to examine outcomes for interventions. There's a line of thinking that models require a great deal of conviction before we use them for intervention. This is a very high bar, and we need to have all the scientific evidence um, that we can you know, in place before we tentatively um, uh, start to, to use our models for intervention. Um, I would note some of the big science, big modeling writings of Michael Wolfson, for example, um, in this score. Um, uh, and some of those in uh, other modelers in the U.S. I've also heard um, uh, advocate similar uh, uh, cautious perspective. There's another line of thinking about this look. What's the alternative? And what are we relying on instead right now? It's often not really well thought through models. It's in fact often fairly inchoate mental models on uh, amorphous, um, incompletely reasoned about and evidenced, um, sometimes seat of the pants um, uh, reasoning, and, and reasoning that's awfully naive in light of the complex situation. So there's another, there's another body of scholars and uh, practitioners who argue, look, if you've got good reason to think your model is a lot better than anything out there, even if it's not you know, nearly as pinned down as you'd like it to be scientifically, it's better than what's going on right now, and it, it's a step forward to advance it. And there's, there's disagreements in the modeling field uh, about that. But here, you know, we're in investigating the effects of intervention in the context of, of theorizing. Um, uh, we also model to anticipate what might be coming on. Those who were at my last boot camp know this has a particularly promising element of when you combine dynamic models with in incoming evidence. And we may hear a case study uh, about this later in the week. Um, but the idea is we can take a model and ground it with evidence till this point and use this model to anticipate what might be coming going forward in light of um, our improved understanding of what's taking place right now with this red, this is kind of the current point, this red line. We've taken into account all this evidence till now, and we use the model understanding about what's probably going on right now from a probabilistic perspective to anticipate what might be coming down the pike in future months and years. Um, 
And uh, per my comments, modeling is the least. Uh, so Winston Churchill once said about democracy. He said, democracy is the worst form of government except for everything else. And I think modeling is the worst, <laughs> worst type of way to plan except for everything else. I count myself as a skeptical modeler, but it's the least bad of the alternatives uh, that I know. And uh, it's a, sure a lot better than fighting the tide and banging your head against brick walls. Um, uh, so uh, I model because I, I don't have a better way to address these needs um, than, um, than making use of, of uh, models of the sort that we're talking about today. There's a lot of needs within the modeling space that are you know, uh, under-resourced and need to be enhanced, and I've dedicated much of my career to advancing the methodology of modeling um, as much as its application. And much of my work modeling with machine learning, big data, science is, is motivated by the desire and the conviction that we can do better. But um, you know, we're also at, at work with uh, uh, a variety of other methodological advances, tool-wise, et cetera. To advance things. So those were some comments on motivations yesterday. Some of those didn't really come out in my informal walkthrough, but I hope that gives you a kind of a uh, situates you and, and uh, more firmly in, in the perspective being articulated here. Um, following that, we talked about three major modeling traditions. We talked about system dynamics modeling. We talked about discrete event simulation. We talked about agent-based modeling. Um, and I did so uh, by choice, given the level of strong level of interest expressed by this group in hybrid modeling. I wanted to make sure that people have some bearing on each of those traditions on its own before we talk about weaving them together. Um, and uh, each of the traditions, I argued, was uh, distinctive. Um, brought some unique strengths to the table, um, uh, rich in its areas of application. But these techniques often differ in their goals. And what you will find is, and I can tell you, because I've, I've uh, many a time have I taken, um, taken flat from people on one modeling camp or another um, who uh, dislike the fact that I consort with models of many sorts. Um, uh, there's a, a tribalist uh, mentality that's traditionally been out there. It's fading generationally now. Um, uh, of those who argue that one method is the true method. There are those that argue that discrete event simulation is the, the, the true way of building models of the world. There's those who argue system dynamics, system dynamics now, and system dynamics forever. Um, and there's people who argue that about agent-based model, you know, often with a sort of technocratic feel to it. You know, we're going to crush these other sorts of models. Like, and they're going to bow before the, the computational might of agent-based model. And I have very little, I have very little uh, sort of re respect for people who have only practiced in one tradition, trying to say their tradition is better than all the others. I mean. It, it, there's, there's an authenticity required to at least apply multiple traditions richly before you can, before you can honestly assess their trade-offs. And uh, much of my career has been spent doing just that. Um, and it's very clear to me, after hundreds of models built um, using multiple traditions, that they are best, they are each fit for certain types of areas, best fit for certain types of areas, and they are best used together. But I want to highlight something else that I mentioned in passing, which is different techniques seek to address different problems. And this is a lot of the reason for the disconnect. You'll find agent-based modelers kind of looking down their nose at, um, sometimes noisily in conference presentations, um, sort of uh, you know, sneering at system dynamics models that are simpler and saying like, oh, come on, you know, that's a trivial model. Um, you know, you've, you've got a two-stock model, a three-stock model, you know, what sort of, what sort of seriousness can you, can you have if you're postulating that as your model of the system? We have models, you know, with hundreds of thousands of agents and 
you know, uh, dozens of types of parameters and elements of state each. And, you know, our model is obviously more grounded and rich than yours. And, and you get attitudes like that which fail to realize that often the system dynamics models are motivated by desire to shift mental models. And they have to be simple to shift mental models um, clearly because you're trying to teach very clear, simple lessons that can be explained. And that model is often built in a participatory process with others who contribute to its design and, and the particular stocks used and so on. And, and the system dynamics modelers have different goals often with the modeling project and the agent-based models. Um, certainly then micro simulation models, are, which tend to be a very technocratic tradition, say used in the halls of government, um, quite different from the, you know, in the community feel of a uh, growing number of system dynamics projects. They try, to, they try to address different questions. In many ways, it reminds me of, of uh, some of the encounters of world religions where you know, re religions would sort of criticize each other, often criticizing another religion on the terms of the questions and terms and needs of their own religion and, and looking down at another that doesn't seek to address those questions. Um, and the questions being addressed or the problems being addressed by different modeling traditions are often quite different. The goals of the modeling processes. And often those who cast dispersions on different traditions don't have the authenticity of recognizing the different motivations at hand. And, and they, they criticize it for, from the framing and, and uh, perspective of what's valuable of their tradition alone. This is a big problem within dynamic modeling traditionally. And uh, you will often get uh, you know, misplaced critique uh, motivated by, this, um, uh, by these misunderstandings or misreadings of the situation. So be aware that these different traditions are rich, powerful, um, each have unique areas where there's nothing else like them that can compare in certain areas. Um, nearly as well. Um, they have unique competitive advantages, but also bear in mind that um, they often come with, with different goals um, associated with them and, and approach them from, a, from an appreciation that the questions being asked are probably different. The goal of the modeling may be different than what you think from, from your background. Um, so that's a comment on those traditions, those three traditions. I argued yesterday, and I'm a firm believer of the fact they have more in common than they are different. They all share, this is an important point, you may be, your mind may be spinning about these things, but they all share certain features. They all share a depiction, so they can be viewed as positing theory about the world um, and the dynamics of the world, about these complex systems, and they all share to do so a depiction of the state of the of the state of the world, some sort of simplified description of model state, and some characterization of how the state changes. So I'll, I'll write it: a state self, state delta, the change in state. Um, so the delta of the state um, uh, based on the current state, um, on the current state. This is, every framework does this. Um, so system dynamics modeling, the state uh, is stocks, the values of the stocks. The change in state, or the rate of change is specified flows, right? System dynamics model. That's how we specify things. We specify, this is the state of the system at the initial time, and then we say, given the state of the system, how do the flows, or what are the values of the flows? That's what we're specifying mostly in the system dynamic model, the values of flows, formulations, formulas for the flows in terms of the current state. So it says if there's a million people in the hospital, people are discharged, a lot more people are discharged per day than if there's a thousand people in the hospital or then there are zero. In general, the flows depend on, this, on the stock, values of the stocks. That's system dynamics. In age-based modeling, 
it may not have been as obvious, but that's exactly what we were doing. We were saying, um, I'll call up, here's a, uh, an agent-based model I'll, I'll pull in. Um, maybe we'll, we'll go to that uh, one we, we started with here. Um, here, we were characterizing the evolution, for example, of a person here um, according to similar aspects of state. So if a person is in a state of not seeking food, that's how it depends on the state, then you have a certain situation in which you will change to having a state of heading to the supermarket, another one of heading to the convenience store. So we are specifying through these state charts the state and how that state changes and under what conditions that state changes. That's that same basic picture is you have a state and you have some change in it. And it's formulated in different language, right? I mean, for, for the different uh, models, we saw uh, different ways of characterizing it. Um, for example, um, here, we'll, uh, we'll call up this one um, and we'll go look at a person uh, here. But, you know, if someone's in a pre-diabetic state, they have a certain chance per take your time unit per year, say, of, of uh, developing type 2 diabetes. There's a hazard rate, a, a certain uh, hazard um, here, a, chance, a probability per unit time of, of developing type 2 diabetes. So again, state and change in state according to some, so the change in state is an action and it's, it's uh, governed by some rule here based on a, a hazard rate that applies in continuous time. So people change. So, so agent-based modeling also has the basic feature of a state and a, a change in state which is contingent on the state. You're not going to develop diabetes unless you're pre-diabetic in this model, right? Which change can apply or, or the nature of the change, the character of the change um, depends on your current state. If, if you're someone who already has a transplant, you're not going to be developing, you know, diabetes. You already have diabetes here for, if this is a model of uh, end-stage renal disease uh, caused by diabetes. So the point is, agent-based modeling fits in that framework. It turns out discrete event modeling uh, fits into that framework. Your ability to progress at any one time, you have queues and the number of the, the, the agents in those queues and the number of resources available and who those resources are bound to. There's an underlying current state, in short. Um, and uh, then the, the ability for uh, a person, for example, to get discharged uh, who's under workup by a physician uh, will depend how long they've been under that physician's workup. Um, if they've been there for 15 minutes, maybe now they'll be uh, discharged. So the change in state, someone progressing on, say, from a workup or someone getting a nurse um, uh, assigned to them, before this nurse is assigned to them, they, uh, there has to be a nurse freed up, and so there needs to be a nurse free. Uh, and so this change in state it involves binding to resources, it involves progressing through those uh, and through those uh, uh, those workflows, those structured workflows that we saw, and it involves um, it involves uh, the, um, the the uh, the deallocation of resources uh, as well. So here's our here's our simplified clinic, and someone's progression through here depends on the state of the system, um, uh, availability of healthcare workers, and so on. So all these techniques in their own in their own unique way, specify state, and they specify how that state changes based on the current state. And based on this, this is how we get history dependence, this is how we get feedbacks, this is how we get uh, systems which can exhibit lock-in, etc. These are all just different languages for expressing this basic, uh, this basic parent. They're all just different ways of, of, of specifying it that are really well suited to certain types of, of systems, okay? So those are those three traditions we saw yesterday. Um, and we'll be seeing a lot more of them. In the afternoon, I talked about weaving those together. And I showed five different sort of compelling, recurrent 
ways of knitting them together. Um, uh, where a given model will have elements of multiple traditions. And uh, these models I'm showing you were for, from that uh, time period, but we had you know, clinics characterized with discrete event simulation embedded in an agent-based model where agents could engage in care seeking, for example. Or we had agents whose dynamics were governed, such as immune dynamics, were governed by system dynamics models, right? These are different ways of weaving together these different techniques. And one of probably the premier advantage of any logic as a platform is that you can weave these together almost without noticing it. You can just kind of go drop one of these in and you have what's in fact a, a hybrid model um, without perhaps realizing that you are crossing the transom into a different tradition. And um, it turns out that there will be a need to take this further to be conscious of when you, uh, when you engage in some of these embeddings. For example, this is one that is significant for moral performance in ways we'll talk about later in the week. But the point is that you can weave these together seamlessly. And I should emphasize this, this point. System dynamics in health and healthcare is often applied at an aggregate level, but here you see it applied at an individual level. These state charts you see here, we often think of them as operating within agents, but we can put a state chart in the main in, to in the global environment. Maybe it represents seasons, right? Spring, summer, autumn, and winter. Um, and we put it in, in the global environment. Um, uh, or it represents, you know, whether a beach is closed or not, you know, or, or, or there's a certain policy in effect. In short, don't get caught up in the notion that certain things only belong at the agent level or only belong at the overall level. Um, we can weave things together um, uh, quite nicely, and sometimes some of the most powerful strategies take something that you're used to thinking of operating at a high level, like a stock and flow model, and instead putting it at a granular level. Maybe it's places for contamination with, um, with waterborne contaminants. Uh, or maybe it's um, uh, capturing, um, capturing dynamics within an individual. So those are some aspects of um, uh, hybrid models that I, I wanted to hit on. So a bit of a retrospective from yesterday. Uh, filling in some of the gaps. Any questions related to that material, either the points I've just made or the material from yesterday? Questions? Yeah? It's not about the materials, but just um, I'm kind of curious about the software. So yeah. agent, um, any logic, obviously, I mean, these kind of hybrid models, but is this one of the only ones that can do that? So if, for example, like, um, right. Yeah, so great question. This was, um, this was uh, something which um, needs to be addressed in today's context because when I first started teaching these boot camps, any logic was pretty much the only game in town if you wanted to do this. Now the situation is very different. Um, and uh, I made some reference to the fact that there are now discrete event simulation packages which aspire to some loosening of the rules for entities and those workflows to incorporate some aspect of agent-based modeling. You will also find uh, DenSim making some accommodation for sort of discrete event type reasoning. Um, uh, uh, Repast, uh, an, uh, another venerable agent-based package has incorporated uh, some elements of system dynamics models into it, um, and which have been used by colleagues of mine like Ross Hammond to build models which include um, dynamics that are continuous within agents. And Narges just pointed out to me yesterday um, something I had forgotten. I had stumbled on it earlier, but had forgotten, which is NetLogo now has expanded its support to allow for some incorporation of system dynamics within, within that local models. Um, and we've, we've 
uh, done some work with that logo uh, over the years, uh, here and there. Um, uh, I, there, there was a kind of funny fork in the road. Uh, in 1990, um, I was doing my first Asian-based modeling. Um, and uh, and uh, there's a long story to that, but there was someone from the MIT Media Lab who heard I was interested in modeling through a colleague and brought over what was called Star Logo at the time, which was NetLogo's like original inception. And they showed me this. And and uh, I thought, oh, that's that's pretty interesting. But I prefer my framework. Thank you very much. And um, it went on to become that logo, and is you know a major platform um, uh, now for uh, what I would call um, uh, you know interactively rich um, uh, agent-based modeling that uh, now incorporate some elements of system dynamics in a graphical way that uh, I find rather appealing. Um, one of the things that uh, Narges and I are looking into right now, and, and Narges may have some updates on this later today or, or tomorrow, would be um, just how flexibly you can weave it in um, uh, to, to uh, agent behavior and so on. And I'd be glad to comment. I actually have a bunch of slides on different platforms and some of their strengths and limitations. And um, I view myself as a kind of, I try to be uh, as balanced as I can on this. Um, uh, and I'd be glad to share our experiences. Collectively, the TAs in the room, and some not in the room also, um, uh, have actually uh, a lot of experience with different platforms. Uh, I did a lot of work with Repast early on uh, before I, I started using uh, uh, any logic um, and uh, had some significant use of NetLogo in the context of, um, of a joint project which built the same model in multiple platforms um, and for use in our group. So collectively it was significant exposure. So I'd be glad to talk about this later in the, in the, in the week. And um, I'd be glad to have, if you're interested, students walk you through different packages or show you some of the trade-offs where you're interested. As I said, one of the interesting things we've done is create the same model in multiple packages. Um, so that, to give us a concrete sense of like, what are the, the differences between articulating. Um, yeah, uh, great question. Other questions? Okay, um, so that was a, a, a retrospective. We have lots of material for this morning. So what I'd like to suggest is uh, we take a, um, a brief break in case um, anyone wants to use the, the facilities or, or get a bit more food for breakfast. If we could try to be back here about five minutes, we're gonna jump in wholesale into the model conceptualization area, okay? And, and really grapple with this gnarly issue, okay? Um, so let's take a very brief break and uh, we'll continue shortly. Thank you. I have a quick question. Was there any updates to the uh, primary care model at the last hackathon? Uh, it's 